Welcome everybody to part four of our humanitarian applications using NASA Earth Observations RSET webinar. Um, today we are talking about uh, assessing climate hazards at refugee camps. And as you recall from the previous parts, um, we've gone over the arc of uh, different kinds of humanitarian applications in the context of armed conflict and displacement. So um, we started with uh, monitoring urban damage with INSAR last week. Um, then we moved towards mapping refugee settlement growth and population change, and then agricultural and vegetation change. And so today we're sort of at the, uh, the other end of the spectrum, thinking about conditions at the location, sort of exogenous conditions at uh, refugee settlement locations, and also thinking about more of a long-term habitation, recurrent risk, um, long, sort of persistent hazards um, at refugee camps. Um, so we're we're here on part four today. Just like all the other sessions, um, this will be about two hours long, and that will include a question and answer session at the conclusion. So be uh, feel free to be entering your questions into the chat box as we go forward, and we'll collect those and then answer them at the end of the presentation. So um, this presentation is really motivated from the fact that we have new refugee settlements established in new locations. Off, uh, a settlement is often in a, um, created in sometimes a remote or borderland region. Um, in some cases, there aren't other human settlements in the sort of direct proximity. So with that new location, we have new kinds of climate hazards that um, large populations hadn't been exposed to before. So there's sort of new considerations and scenarios that haven't been um, examined or certainly um, not analyzed from a research perspective. Um, we have a lot of new data, of course, from satellite and other sources to study climate-driven events and hazards, but that data doesn't always mean it's going to be used appropriately or effectively, and it may not be used at all. Um, this uh, this uh, part of the training is trying to leverage the available data we have from satellites and other sources um, to start estimating climate and environmental exposure in a sort of a systematic way, um, such that we can take the same kind of assessment site after site after site and certainly uh, country after country um, in, a, uh, in an attempt to aid a more systematic uh, examination of climate hazards at refugee camps. So um, our goals today, we'll be using a multi-criteria hazard analysis to estimate climate hazard potential across multiple sites focused in a refugee hosting region of Bangladesh. Um, we'll be looking at how these different products uh, influence our assessment, different satellite products influence our assessment, and we'll be um, looking a little bit at how um, climate hazard profiles compare to some of these known hazard events. As a reminder, um, there will be one homework assignment for this webinar series that will be posted on the training page. Um, it'll be due July 7th, and um, to uh, th that's part, uh, completing that homework assignment is part of the certificate of completion for this uh, webinar. Um, you are expected to attend all the webinars and complete the homework assignment by that deadline, and submission of that um, will uh, warrant a certificate which you'll receive about two months after the completion of the course. So information on this slide as well as um, on the training page. My name is Jamin Vanderlook. I'm an associate professor of geography um, at Oregon State University. I've been speaking thus far. Um, with me uh, presenting today are uh, Andrew and Michael, um, both of whom who have been involved in uh, different kinds of climate change and climate hazard analyses. Uh, in kind of different contexts uh, around the world. So we'll be uh, hearing from them later in the presentation. As a reminder, we have a few uh, previous RSET trainings that we could recommend for thinking about sort of preparing for some of the themes and topics we'll be talking about today. Uh, one is uh, SAR for disasters and hydrological applications. We aren't going to be using SAR directly, but certainly for this sort of um, context of disasters and hydrological applications. That's a, a good training. Uh, we have earth observations for disaster risk assessment and resilience and uh, remote sensing for disasters scenarios. So check those out. Um, they will provide a good um, bit of precedence before we uh, enter today's topics. So let's do a little bit of uh, background on um, mapping environment and climate exposure in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. 
So from a global perspective, um, we know that refugee camps are exposed to climate hazards, such as landslides, flooding, droughts, and heat waves. Um, there are, uh, of course, a, as we've talked about in previous um, uh, parts of this training, we have a global distribution of refugee camps and refugee settlements around the world. Many of these settlements have um, non-durable dwellings, so dwellings that are sort of uh, ephemeral or temporary or um, constructed without any formal uh, safety or, or sort of um, uh, protocols that would, that would help uh, protect against or mitigate the effect of uh, landslides, flooding, uh, things like this. Um, we also know that camps are placed often in isolated and marginal borderlands. Um, the, this sort of general setting, both at the dwelling as well as the regional area, um, can contribute to some of the uh, climate exposure that we'll be talking about today. Um, and as we've touched on in other parts of this training, uh, the refugees themselves are also made vulnerable socially from restrictive migration as well as communication policy. So there may not be a lot of climate hazard information coming into the camp um, in terms of early um, warnings. Um, and there may also not be very supportive migration policies to allow refugees to leave with a pending hazard in the same way that um, others uh, living outside of the refugee camp might be able to flee in advance. We have one example here, a picture on the left uh, showing flooding in uh, Cox's Bazaar refugee camp from 2017. We'll be talking about Cox's Bazaar um, later in the presentation, but this is really one of the epicenters um, of awareness, at least, in terms of climate hazard exposure in a refugee setting because it's been um, uh, affected many, many times in, in quite large scale way. Now we know that uh, Cox's Bazaar has been affected. We know that there are uh, certainly other cases, other um, camps that have been affected by climate hazards. However, there's little research on environmental and climate hazards at refugee camps. A lot of the stories, a lot of the evidence we have are sort of one-offs. They're, um, we could call them as anecdotal evidence, which isn't a diminishment of the value of the evidence, but uh, it's a reflection of the fact that we don't have a systematic assessment it's, it's localized here, it's localized here, one event, one event. We don't have right now a real systematic assessment across multiple refugee sites across uh, decades, for example. Um, but we have lots of, uh, lots of um, uh, single lines of evidence that show that this is a phenomenon we need to be concerned about. In 2006, for example, um, heavy rains flooded the Dadaab refugee camp complex in northeastern Kenya. Uh, it was a deadly flooding event. Two people were killed. Uh, about 13,000 um, people's homes were lost. 2017, the same camp, Dadaab, was affected by another flood. Um, in this case, 60, 63,000 refugees were directly affected. Um, and uh, nearby, in 2014, uh, the Liutkyor refugee camp in Ethiopia was flooded. Uh, here's a picture of it on the left. Um, it basically uh, forced the relocation of 40,000 refugees. So uh, these are serious challenges when we have uh, already a scarce availability of resources, often, uh, again, remote isolated areas, perhaps not great connectivity to infrastructure or aid delivery or, you know, evacuation routes, right? Um, so this can be uh, an acute challenge in already resource strapped areas. Flooding at Cox's Bazaar has perhaps uh, received the most attention. Um, there have been a series of flash floods. This is the kind of higher impact, higher magnitude flood events that we know about. 1988, 92, 98, 2012, 2015, and 2021. So already we're uh, going back um, uh, about a uh, over a 30 year record there from 88 to 2021. Um, we know in 2021, this most recent large-scale flooding event, that eight people were killed, 21,000 people were uh, displaced. Um, again, this is a recurrent challenge within this area. The floodwaters can go to chest high on an adult and go over the heads of young children, one to two meters. Um, the water could be a, a flash event, um, lingering for uh, several hours, or could last an entire day. Um, there's also a serious contribution to increased landslide potential, which can also be deadly and can also wash away homes and roads. 
Um, the flooding and the landslides can also destroy terraces and crops. Um, so the livelihood implications or food security implications are can be severe as well. So there's really a multi-dimensional phenomenon, um, a multi-dimensional uh, danger coming from uh, these different flood events. Um, we also have the great concern of just the sheer population density um, across Cox's Bazaar. 1.2 million Rohingya refugees are distributed across 34 different camps in this region called Cox's Bazaar. Um, the population in general, the refugee population in general, has been there a long time since um, the 1970s. However, it was this 2017 arrival of um, over half of the current population, 700,000 refugees, that led to the, the kind of phenomenon we see on the right hand side here with right about now in the animation where this large scale um, deforestation and land clearing that took place to establish um, new uh, terraces and dwellings for uh, the incoming Rohingya refugee who were fleeing um, violence and persecution in neighboring Myanmar. Um, these um, flooding events now um, come mainly in the summertime, Northern Hemisphere summertime, June and August. Um, and there's about an average uh, of 1.6 meters of rain that falls within these months, June, July, and August, uh, looking at the historical average. So it's a, a lot of rain over a short period of time in a landscape that is uh, often exposed with bare soil due to the terracing. And so that land use as well contributes to increased um, uh, landslide potential. As mentioned, the policies themselves can also, refugee policies can compound the um, mitigation of these events. Um, we know that um, uh, voluntary migration is a key strategic decision to mitigate climate effects. Um, people, when they can, they leave, right? If there's, if there's a pending danger. Um, and we know that higher temperatures and rainfall extremes drive out migration in other parts of the world in Cox's Bazaar and in many other refugee settings, that kind of voluntary migration is restricted um, by asylum policies that uh, that confine refugees to refugee camps, um, not just during the climate hazard prone period, but throughout the year and over many, many years. Um, there's this restriction on migration um, that uh, basically keeps refugees in place, even though we know um, that an extreme event may be coming. So there's sort of this uh, need to prepare and to anticipate um, these events so that we can build um, some mitigative potential uh, since one of the key uh, opportunities, migration, is not there. So that's one of the motivations for our, our training today is um, building up this awareness um, through quantitative use of satellite data and derived products to better assess uh, likelihood of climate and environmental exposure. That's a present concern. But of course, we know that um, future climate change effects, such as more rainfall and higher temperatures in Bangladesh and other refugee hosting countries are going to make these challenges probably, not always, but in many cases, will make them more acute, will make them more severe and more frequent. So we have this uh, increased likelihood of even more uh, climate hazard exposure as uh, climate change advances, as we can see here um, with uh, these maps on the on the top register of mean annual surface temperature increases um, by about mid-century and a change in annual precipitation by about mid-century. In both cases, uh, we see this, of course, global distribution, um, but these changes that we're seeing are going to play out differently in different contexts and, of course, compound existing uh, hazards and risks. So in a refugee setting, understanding climate risk is not just thinking about how erratic is the rainfall? How much rainfall do we get? It really is a com uh, well refugee setting as well as anywhere else. We want to think about this from the um, from multiple perspectives. It's not just weather and climate. We want to think about uh, the social vulnerability. We want to think about um, the likelihood of exposure. So that that's in the refugee setting would be thinking about the the kinds of dwellings, the kind of infrastructure that's there. Um, and on top of that, of course, we have this background. Uh, fairly low adaptive capacity, which is to say the resources that are needed to adjust uh, or respond to these actual or expected climate effects 
um, we have a marginalized, economically marginalized, societally marginalized, and geographically marginalized communities um, that are affected by similar kinds of climate hazards that other communities are affected by, but they don't have the resources to respond, and they're restricted due to these uh, various uh, uh, policies that I've mentioned prior. So it's not just we're not in this presentation. We are just focused on the climate and weather side of things, um, but the bigger picture is much more complicated than that. So, with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Andrew, who's going to uh, walk through um, some of our uh, case study on environmental and climate exposure at Cox's Bazaar. Thanks, Jamin. Um, my name is Andrew Kruchkevich, and I'll be taking everyone through the second part of of this training. Um, we're going to be diving into a specific case study. So building off what Jamin was saying in terms of the different ingredients, really, to understand risk. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by the climate environmental factors, the social factors? You know, These are important ingredients when we're trying to get a sense of, of what it is like on the ground. And this is important in any context, as Jamin said, but in particular, in particular for areas that are more complex in socioeconomic settings such as such as refugee camps so I'm going to be sharing an example that is 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 one that's very close to me um, about it must be five years now uh, I was working with uh, some UN organizations uh, one in specific was called the interagency standing committee which is a group um, at UN um, headquarters here in New York that seeks to coordinate a lot of the disaster and climate um, activities of the UN and other activities, primarily humanitarian activities. And during that time, there were questions about, well, we're developing standards um, and methods for integrating climate information into decision making, but we actually have we, we actually have a situation happening right now. You know, and this was back in 2000, I guess 17 at one of the the most recent let's say, movements of population from Myanmar to Bangladesh. Uh, and they said, well, this is something that's happening now. And if we're thinking about what data sets we could use, you know, when do we integrate these data sets? What are the decisions that could be impacted? Where is the responsibility? You know, who is accountable for integrating data into decision making? They said, well, there's something happening now and we need to address that. And this is referring to the, the Rohingya refugee crisis. And they asked, they asked myself and um, a few colleagues to, to make a couple of visits over the next year or so to support this. So I'll be telling a little bit more. I'll be sharing some pictures about or from, from the, 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 the area around Cox's Bazaar and in and around Cox's Bazaar to talk about, you know, what did we do when we're, we had to identify which data is sufficient to integrate into decision making um, in a very complex situation. So we decided to start off with this picture here. And this is a picture taken, well, the next set of photos were taken by myself and a colleague, Melody Brown, who were, the, um, who were part of the, the, the team that was tasked to think about what types of data can be integrated into disaster risk reduction um, as they were building the refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar, the refugee camps, I should say, and what types of hazards should be prioritized. And this was from one of the first days where we were working with IOM, International Organization for Migration, and UNDP, the UN Development Program, as well as with World Food Program and UNHCR. Um, and we were getting a sense, we're getting a, familiarized with the setting. And this is from one of the tops of the hills of the refugee camp, Camp 10, as you see in the flag. And this is a snapshot of what it looked like at the at the peak of the dry season. This was March 20, I guess 2018. This was, and there was a lot of talk about the rainy season is coming. And in, and in the rainy season in, in Bangladesh, there is significant and prolonged heavy rainfall for months, and there was a, a rush to to better to get an idea of which data should be used, which areas could be prioritized, who would be impacted. And yeah, essentially, how do we prioritize and what actions can we take? So this is just an overview of the setting and, 
as you can see here, there's many um, there's many housing units. Many of them don't have very strong roofs, and many of them have cloths in terms in in terms of kind of covering covering the houses and the doorways and the windows. Something you cannot quite see here, but I'll point out if you look at the center left, you see some blue structures. Those are latrines, which are right up against the hillside on some very steep slopes. Uh, other things to note here, you will see some greenery, very little greenery, but this area used to be one of Bangladesh's uh, last dense forest area. So you could maybe get a sense of all the trees that were cut down, uh, which also led to a change in the topography and also many of the other environmental and hydrologic conditions in this area. Here's another picture. And again, this is for this is a picture taken at the at the the peak of the dry season, the very, hottest time of the year, right before the rainy season starts. And there's a few things to point out. Actually, I think what I'll do is we'll wait 10 seconds and have everybody think about like what are some of the elements that point out here that that stand out to you here so I'll give it 10 seconds think about look closely what do you see what's going on um, in this picture I'll give you 10 seconds Okay, wrap, wrapping up. So there's a few things to highlight, and and I hope that even things I don't mention, uh, you that you'll have other things to highlight. I'm interested in hearing what what you're thinking about. But again, yes, you see some of those blue structures, those latrines on the steep slopes. They're here again. Uh, you also see there's people doing things. There's people moving about. You know, I, I don't know if anyone here has has been in a refugee camp or or seen a refugee camp, but there's a lot of activity. You know, this isn't a place where people just sit in the houses. Like these, these are. This is a place where things happen. People are moving. There's movement in this image. Something else to note: there is standing water already. Like we're talking about the end of the end of the dry season, the peak of the dry season. There's already standing water. So there was a lot of questions around what what flood mapping products. What what, what does flood risk mean when there's already areas that are somewhat inundated? And that was a, that was a very difficult question to to address because. Yeah, like what does it mean? Like, if we're talking about which areas are going to flood, what does it mean they're going to flood like from this source and kind of expand outwards? Was this body of water connected to a some sort of river or stream system? There's many questions. Another thing to point out here is if you look at the top left of that hill in the background, you will see one tree. And this is something that I still kind of stick, sticks out to me. It remind it stands it sticks in my memory. This one tree, and I to this day I don't know why they left that tree, but it's a reminder of how tall the trees used to be, how dense that forest could be. It's hard to imagine this area covered by forest, and what it would look like to have that kind of thriving um, sense to to this land. But that's that was the size, that was the height of the trees that that existed in this area before the decision was made to to build these to build the camp here. And I should also note that this is just one of many refugee camps in Cox's Bazar. This is a picture from Kutupalong, which also known as the mega camp, and I believe approximately seven or 800,000 uh, refugees living. But there are many other refugee camps that look very different from here that we'll also talk about a bit later. So as you can see here, uh, this what, what are we looking at here? So this is a satellite image for, uh, of the, the mega camp, Kutupalong, and you could see almost like, let's say, they they look like kind of streams almost, but those are areas, uh, lines of, of topography in some ways that separate some of the sub camps from other sub camps. And we could see the patterns emerge here of different housing units, you know, that are that are placed in areas that in order to maximize uh, the amount of people that could be that could be that could be sheltered and it makes me makes us think about like why was this area prioritized you know what are the the decisions that go into selecting this part of bangladesh and there's many reasons for that you know it's not a straightforward answer but for whatever reason this is the area that they picked and this this 
refugee camp was expanding very rapidly back in 2017, 2018, as you can see. And here's another picture. And I know we're spending uh, time sharing pictures here, but I think it's important to get a sense of the setting. Uh, one thing that we acknowledge is that is in if you're interested in working not only in refugee camps but migration settings and other complex socioeconomic contexts, is a very privileged place to be to even discuss what risk means, you know, in the context of of the most vulnerable populations. And I think this picture reminds at least myself to reflect on that. You know, this is the main road that transects transects the um, the mega camp Katupalong, and it evokes to me at least a sense of of not only the intensity of the camp but also the depth. It seems like the camp goes on for a very long time if you look in the distance, and I think that's an important element of this. We are Earth scientists. We are satellite data, you know, Earth observation data scientists, um, but we're also people. And I, it's it's our responsibility to keep that in mind when we are when we are thinking about what it means to integrate satellite data or any data into decision making. So I think that is important to say before we move forward. So going back to this picture about um, about what that had the body of water in the the foreground there, um, our job in supporting the disaster risk reduction strategy in the refugee camp was not necessarily about developing new forecasts or new data sets or new systems or tools or interfaces or apps. Um, it's actually most responsible to make sure you know what is available first before the reaction, um, before you react by developing something new, which will have implications on how decisions are made. So after various discussions and meetings, we realized that there's actually three primary questions that they were interested in that time that they asked us to support. And those are the three in the top left. Where can floods occur? What type of floods? And then where can landslides occur? So these are questions related to hydrometeorological extreme events. Um, there were questions around like, will rainfall forecast be sufficient if we're trying to understand risk? Uh, can we disaggregate, you know, within a, a refugee camp areas that are at relatively higher or lower risk? If we prioritize one area of the refugee camp, maybe 200,000 people over another, what does it mean to deprioritize the remaining people who may not receive the benefit of an early warning system or some sort of early action? These are critical questions to remember. And yeah, it's when you're when you're thinking about prioritizing a group or benefiting one group over another, not only refugee camp, but more broadly, you're also contributing to a decision to deprioritize some other group of people. So what do you do when everyone is the most vulnerable? And that was one of the questions that still haunts us to this day. When you have data that allows you to distinguish between the most vulnerable population and the least vulnerable population, if there is significant distance between those two, perhaps it's justifiable, but what do you do when everyone is the most vulnerable? And that is a very complex question, but one we're faced with um, when we're thinking about refugee camp management. These are the most most vulnerable um, in a global perspective. So again, like thinking about the hazards, well, I mean, this area, Cox's Bazaar in Southeast Bangladesh is a climate shock prone area. And what we mean by that is this isn't a new thing. Like they're, they're, there's a history of floods. There's a history of coastal flooding. There's a history of riverine flooding. There's a history of flash flooding, pluvial flooding. Um, there's a history of the historical data shows this is an area, the Bay of Bengal, that has frequent tropical cyclones. You know, and these are there. Are, fortunately, there is data available to help us understand the risk of the past um, and up to the present. But this is a situation that is a protracted crisis. The Rohingya refugee crisis is not something that has happened 
in the past five or six years. It's been going on for up over 20 years in different waves, in different cycles. And we were, we were very much thinking about not only the historical um, disaster risk, but also what's happening now and how that might change in the future. But yes, I mean, so what do you do? Like if there, there's an understanding of, of the historical risk of disasters, there's, a, there's the understanding that that might change in the future, but what can we do? We must do something. Action can be taken if risk is understood. And if you do develop standard operating procedures, if there is a shift in risk, then there is a potential to prioritize one area over another. Um, and that was one of the goals of, of our work, which was funded by NASA as part of the, a project we called COMPASS, that led to a workshop in which the report on the right-hand side was produced, Use of Climate and Risk Information, the Rohingya Refugee Response. And this is freely available and happy to, to send this for an even deeper dive into what data we used, what decisions were influenced, and also an interesting section on using a process called the decision-making flowcharts, which allow us to outline which questions are being asked related to disaster risk reduction what data is currently being used, and then what data is available and could potentially complement the existing data being used, or perhaps should actually be prioritized over the existing data. Of course, what comes into this discussion is the idea of mandates and roles and responsibilities of producing data, disseminating data, tailoring the data. This is all, um, these are all important elements of that chain from, developing, let's say, producing data all the way through to what we call like decision-making and taking action. So there's more information in, in that report. And yes, thinking about data that's available, I mean, official and authoritative data does exist. And we found that in, in Cox's Bazaar. On the left-hand side, this was a a UNHCR produced map of a flood risk area in the mega camp, Katupalo. In the top right, this is a screenshot from the Bangladesh Meteorological Department. Uh, this is the numerical weather prediction uh, product, which helps us get a sense of rainfall and intensity of rainfall. And in the bottom right, this is a, this is a modeled flood hazard map um, for the various camps not just Katupalong in the top left of that bottom um, bottom image, but the other refugee camps as well. So these the, the products existed. Like there was definitely, this was not an instance where we needed to develop something new necessarily. It was, it is our responsibility to understand what is already in existence. Is this data trusted? What are the mandates, political mandates of using these data? Um, and then this idea of like, well, let's just blend them together. You know, like many times that's an answer for this. Well, there's many data, data sets. Let's just bl we'll blend them together. Well, I mean, which one takes priority? How do you weight this blending? Like, how do you actually do the blending? Like many times they're on different spatial scales. These, these are all questions that, that need, to be, uh, need to be addressed. But wait, there's more. There's more options. It wasn't just those products. There were many, many flood products that were already produced. So this was this was interesting and, and stressful because why was there a need for us to be uh, to be hosted by the intersector coordination group in Cox's Bazaar, which is in charge of developing many of the disasters? Why did they need advice and support and guidance on, on which to use and how to integrate these in decision making? And and one of the answers one of the answers is well that's a skill in itself being able to understand how to tailor the available data into something useful. You know, so a lot of a lot of the work in this context was actually that, was saying, all right, like this is a complex space. What data products are available? Do we understand the quality? To what extent do these need to be used or acknowledged as part of the mandates in the area? Um, so yeah, here's an, another set of products um, that were available. And yeah, all of these come from let's say official and or authoritative sources, but it's hard to blend them together. 
it's hard to, to, to know exactly how to prioritize them. So we came to the case of, well, there's too much data in not enough time. Yes, that is a question you should ask. How is one prioritized over another? How is one deprioritized over another? I know that may seem like the same thing as the previous question, but they're on one hand, they are they are same, similar or at least complementary, but the framing demands a different process to navigate um, the responsibility and accountability for those. It feels better on a personal level and also a professional level to say, we're prioritizing this data and therefore it'll, it'll help this group of people. That feels much better than saying, well, you know what, we're going to prioritize this data source and sorry, this community over here, um, this data says that that you don't get, you don't receive benefit. You're not, you're at risk, but not at a sufficient level of risk. So sorry. And it makes things much harder when you when you see when you look at it that way. But in reality, if you're going to claim a data-driven process or a data, let's say, supported process, that question will arise. Like if you want your pro your your product and process to be sustainable, you're going to have to think about how to address that. And that speaks to the last question there as well about prioritization and deprioritization. So we're just going to go through a little bit more of the, the refugee camps, the different camps here. So the different camps were subject to different types of hazards. If you look at the, nor the nor northernmost camp here that is circled in the red, Katoop along, that's the mega camp. This is an inland camp in an area of, of complex, relatively complex topography. It is subject to riverine and flash floods. You'll see it is not near the coastline, um, over 10 kilometers from the coastline. Therefore, coastal flooding is zero. There is no risk of coastal flooding in this area. However, Nayapara and surrounding camps are actually at risk to various types of floods, flash, riverine, and coastal. It's kind of hard to see here, but actually the eastern side there is the Naf River, and that area is one of the areas where water the churning of the cyclone sometimes pushes seawater up to the eastern side of those camps nayapara camp and the other ones so there is all three types of risks here so when we're talking about flood developing a flood risk reduction plan which type of flood are we referring to and then camp 23 here is primarily at risk of coastal flood is on the coastal plain and is right on the coastline um, flash floods yes there is a low risk Riverine floods, no, because there's only very small streams flowing through here. But the, the main takeaway of this section here is that, yes, many times it is the situation in Bangladesh is generalized to say the refugee camp, you know, or these are the hazards. But actually, when we're talking about populations, there are thousands of people, refugees, in each of these camps. So we need to be sure that we're developing these strategies that are specific to the needs and the risks present in each camp. And as you can see, if you look at the four kilometer scale on the bottom left, this is a fairly narrow and long area. And the risk does change um, over geographic time. I'm sorry, geographic extent um, as you move north to south. And then going back to the social variability as well, it is complex. complex. Uh, Kutupalong camp is mainly new arrivals. So that was that, that very large wave of people moving in 2017 and 18 to Kutupalong. But other camps have had refugees living for many years. Uh, and there's a different dynamic with the local communities, you know, the relationship with the, with the land, with the place. And these are also elements that must be accounted for because when we're talking about disasters, we're not just talking about the extreme climate event. We're talking about those ingredients, the extreme event plus the social context as well. That's what makes a disaster. You don't really have you don't have natural disasters, really. That word is actually not used very often because the hazard may be natural to some extent. However, the combination of the social context and the policies with that extreme event is really what leads to that to the disaster. So the humanitarian de decision-making process is a complex uh, system 
you know, and it consists of, especially when we're talking about climate climate hazards, we will focus on generating a, a composite index of environmental and climatic exposure that reflects the very some considerations that goes into that humanitarian decision making process. We can't say that that the what the single most important factor may be, or necessarily say the, what the best data are. But we compromise here, and the point is we're always compromising. We're always making decisions. And understanding that agency to compromise and make decisions is also part of understanding your own your privilege and your responsibility to interact in this space. So I'm going to hand this over to, to Michael Owen, and he's going to be talking a little bit more about these seven steps um, that you see here on the screen. So yes, thank, thank you all for listening to this section. and. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Andrew. Um, as Andrew had mentioned, my name is Michael Owen, and I'll be taking you through the rest of the tutorial, which will now be about the actual uh, exposure index construction. And so this tutorial will include seven key steps. We'll go over data access and pre-processing. We'll go over kind of an overview of our full methodology, how we go about selecting variables and what those variables are. And then looking a little bit more in depth in terms of the study location, how we calculate the index, and then results. And we'll switch between this slide deck and then also kind of a collab notebook. We'll go over some actual code. So all of our data access and kind of pre-processing is using Google Earth Engine. And we're using a Google Colab notebook, which is essentially just a Jupyter notebook, to actually perform uh, some of this processing. And in addition to Earth Engine, we're using a set of a couple other uh, kind of simplified packages, Python packages, to help aid us uh, through the process. And so because uh, some of the actual index construction is quite time consuming in terms of actual processing, what we've done is actually pre-processed uh, much of the data, which you'll see on slide 43, to allow us to actually quickly go through the information. But we've provided that supplemental code and can go over that um, so that you can go in your own leisure to actually process and generate additional indices. So as we've referenced before, we'll be walking through one potential methodology for indexing uh, environmental and climatic exposure. And so we are going to follow essentially a six-step process to calculate the index. And so this is our high-level overview of the steps that we'll be taking uh, after here. So the first step is really dependent on the area of interest. For some prior work that we've done in East Africa, where we lacked kind of cohesive and de definite uh, camp boundaries, we actually used Sentinel composites to manually trace out camp polygon boundaries, which you can see in point one. Um, however, for Cox Bazaar, we can skip, the, skip this step as we already have reliable high quality spatial boundaries for the camps um, that are, we're using as, as kind of Cox Bazaar which you have seen on the prior slides. And so the next step is to generate essentially a simulated step set of camps, which are going to serve as the reference data set for our analysis. And while it's useful to say, you know, the absolute exposure of camp 35 or whichever camp is X, it's more useful to understand it in the context of the, the situation of the country or of the region. And so we're using these simulated camps to help build essentially a population of other hypothetical areas where camps could be placed. Um, and then after this, we'll use uh, the Earth Engine uh, system to essentially build a stack of 11 variable rasters. And we use these to actually compute uh, the mean value per camp geometry. So this is per simulated camps and then the actual study locations. After this, we'll review the data structure, perform any imputations or modifications if that's necessary. And then finally, we'll normalize the data at the country level. And after that, we can actually you know, generate the exposure index and percentile for each camp. So we're choosing index variables based on a, a three key criteria, and then also removing index variables based on two additional ones. So first we're looking for primarily variables that are uh, included in Google Earth Engine. And this is because it's accessible in kind of a cloud computing environment. 
It allows us to improve accessibility to our framework and reduce actual computation time. We're also looking for variables that are relevant to our site, to the climate and the geography. Um, so for example, looking at components of wet bulb temperature, landslide triggers, or seasonal rainfall patterns. We're also looking for hazards that have been documented in the camps themselves and to make sure that our actual index is kind of actually mapping to the, the lived experience on the ground. And so after we build the initial index and run it over both our simulated and study camps, we then perform a set of additional checks to remove variables that are not relevant. And so first we'll check the distribution of our variables, which we'll explain further in the CoLab notebook. What we're looking for is highly correlated variables. And if we find instances of those, we'll want to uh, read through the literature and remove where necessary. And we also analyze from a qualitative perspective, as, as Jamin had mentioned before, which variables are endogenous versus exogenous. And we want to make sure that, you know, while we might calculate forest loss or additional variables of land cover, we've chosen to remove indicators that could be influenced during camp creation or due to the refugee population from within the camp itself. And this really is aiming to capture variables that are creating enhanced environmental or climatic exposure from outside the camp. Um, and while these have been the focus of other literature, our primary focus is on external exposure. So the following variables here are captured in our index, and you'll see that they originate from a longer list of additional indicators that's in our CoLab notebook. And so we've chosen to primarily focus on uh, variables that are relevant to climate, weather, and geophysical conditions. And these indicators range from both pre-computed products, for example, the Oxford Global Friction Surface, to indicators that we've developed ourselves, like the maximum monthly precipitation, during the rainy season in Bangladesh. And so while some are geographically broadly applicable, we've also tuned a subset of indicators to the geography of our case study. And we think that this is critical to ensure that there are, we are attempting to reflect to our best ability the actual hazards that refugees face in the camps themselves. If we were going to apply this to another geography, for example, we would recommend retuning the index to reflect the given geography's relevant risks. And as you'll see in the middle column here, the indicators range in spatial scale. And so one of the benefits of using Earth Engine as a computing environment is that we don't need to undergo significant work to ensure that variables are homogenous in spatial resolution. So all input variables, and here's a set of three here, have global coverage, nearly global coverage, and have full coverage across the entire country. And so you can see the varying spatial scales here. And so this is cutting out a portion, um, one of the southeastern most divisions of Bangladesh. And you'll see that Cox Bazaar is, is located there in the bottom corner. And we can see already, just based on these three here, um, that relative to the broader region, there's potential aspects of exposure that are high for the camp complex. And this is obviously relevant in the context of this division, but also the broader geography of Bangladesh. And so what we want to do next is then look at the broader uh, context of Bangladesh. And so what we've done here is generated uh, simulated camps that are one kilometer in size. Um, and this set of camps we'll use as essentially our population to sample from. Um, one of the choices that we've made here, which is quite uh, geographically specific is that we've chosen to include all of Bangladesh given its relatively small scale but for prior work that we've done in East Africa where we built similar exposure indices we use the first hundred kilometers of the border region where we find refugee camps and so that should be tuned depending on the actual geography so from now on we'll use kind of a, a combination of code snippets and imagery as background to walk through the rest of the index construction. Um, and so this is some Python code, which is using the Earth Engine API. Even if you don't uh, have full you know, comprehension of the code, it's useful to kind of structure our process as we go through. So in this snippet of code, what we're doing is, is generating the simulated set of camps by first finding the applicable areas where we can actually generate camps from. 
And so we're using the JRC global surface water composites, um, which are also available in Earth Engine, to create a seasonal water mask. Um, and we're looking for any area where there's uh, more than one month of water detected and masking that out. This essentially creates a country level mask of potentially applicable sites that we then use to seed with simulated sites. And so in the next step, we're using that uh, buffer camp to essentially, in this slide, we're using the buffer function that we defined on the prior site as the country level mask. And then we generate uh, essentially X number of camps um, with one kilometer buffers to create our simulated set of camps. These are then exported to an asset, which is also available in our CoLab notebook. So after we've identified our sites, we then create a single stack set of rasters. And this is used as the basis for our index. So while you can see here and on prior slides, they vary in spatial extent, we're still able to generate the mean values at each camp level and each simulated site. We do this by using the cap function in Earth Engine. And this essentially allows us to create that raster stack. And each function call, as you'll see here and in the CoLab notebook, generates an image, which we then concatenate together. We then use a kind of generic function to process each feature collection. And so the feature collection could either be the simulated sites or it could be the actual study camps. These are built essentially as tasks in the Earth Engine Python API, which you'll see uh, at the bottom. Because, as we've said before, this is quite time consuming, depending on the scale and the number of input rasters, we've gone ahead and done this before the tutorial. So when we jump into the CoLab notebook, we'll start from this point. <clears throat> and so after we process the data, we need to perform some additional checks to ensure that the data are ready for index construction. So we'll do a couple of different things. We'll look for missing observations and gaps at the indicator level. And as we'll see in a moment in the CoLab notebook, there are relatively few missing observations. And so we're going to use a, a quite simplified approach that for imputation. But if you use uh, or are working on a more comprehensive set of data where there is larger missing values, there are additional uh, options for imputation, which we outline in the CoLab notebook. And so this is partly by design. As we're using globally uh, comprehensive data sets, there's relatively little need for imputation at our sites, um, but this may vary depending on geography. The other point that we'll go over in the CoLab notebook is looking at the variable distribution. So right here, we have uh, one example of our input layer. So this is WWF's flow accumulation layer. And you'll see that this is, uh, quite varying in, in scale. And because of this, and this is also outlined in some of their documentation, we've got undergone a process known as winterization, which is essentially removing uh, extreme outliers. And so we're essentially clipping the data at the 99th percentile. So after we have a set of coherent source data, we will normalize the data to create the index. And we normalize data so that we have a set that we can generate a uniformly distributed index from. Without this step, we wouldn't really be able to say, you know, that flow accumulation or temperature are comparable. Um, and we have quite a range of data, and so this is a necessary process. And so to do this normalization, we use two different functions. We use min-max normalization and max-min normalization. We use the min-max normalization for the majority of indicators. Um, and this essentially allows us to set zero as the lowest value for that given indicator in the country or population, and one as the highest value. The second function, max min normalization, is used as essentially an inverted version. And this allows us to say that for variables where the lowest value is the worst. And so for example, for surface soil moisture, we use this max min normalization under the hypothesis that reduced surface soil moisture leads to desertification and lower agricultural yields. For the rest of the variables, we use min max normalization and that's more common in the space. 
And so after we've normalized the data, we perform a simple index rank of each variable and then calculate the percentile of each camp within the distribution of camps. And so this allows us to say, for example, that our index finds that a given camp is in the 90th or the 50th percentile of exposure relative to all other potential camp locations for a given country. And so because we have created the, the relative exposure in our actual percentiles, we can show relative and absolute exposure for current locations of refugee camps, as well as potential other future locations for camp siting. And so at this stage, we're going to switch over to the CoLab notebook and go over some more specifics. And again, because this is not a pure programming tutorial, we'll stay at a higher level, but we're providing the material for students that wish to dive a bit deeper into the process as laid out in the CoLab notebook. Okay, and so here we have the CoLab notebook. And so as I said before, this is just a, an interactive Jupyter notebook. Um, and this will be available uh, both in the presentation and, and at this link here in the agenda. So we have uh, a set of scripts here where we'll go over at a high level, but then we can actually look at some of the data here itself. Um, so first we'll run and import some packages. And then secondly, we'll kind of import two functions here that I'll describe in a second. The next step is to actually authenticate with Earth Engine. And so you'll need a Google Earth Engine account or a Google account with Earth Engine access for this step. Um, by running this cell, you'll essentially get a URL displayed below it. And then if you follow the instructions there, you should just paste in your code and you should have uh, authenticated privileges. So I've already gone ahead and done that. And now we can keep going. So the first step really in our process is to load in the source data. And so we have two functions here that we'll use throughout the process. The first is this get info call. And that's kind of restricted often in the uh, JavaScript environment in the Earth Engine GUI. However, we'll use that to essentially pull data out into the Python environment here. The second are the two functions that I've defined above. This allows us to either generate uh, a map of the feature collection. So for example, a map of Cox's Bazaar or an image here. And you'll see that in a second. So the first step is that we can actually pull in these assets. So this is a feature collection of Cox's Bazaar and then also the, the border of Bangladesh. By running this, we can actually see here, we have Cox Bazaar and its relative position in Bangladesh. So as you can see, it's down here. So now that we have Cox Bazaar exported out into the Python environment, essentially as the GeoJSON, we can then transform that into a pandas data frame. So as you can see here, here's the sub camps essentially, or the camps um, of the Cox's Bazaar complex. And we have just the first 10 here. So these are various uh, camp names and their actual indices and their area. The next step is that we'll essentially define uh, another set of helper functions and then start showing some indicative rasters. So the first is to get the last uh, date of a given month and year. The next one is to extract a centroid. So we run these two. Then we can get to the actual index construction process. So this is an indicative set of functions and we have the larger set uh, below linked here. We've chosen two to highlight. So the first is daytime average temperature. The second one is seasonal mass, max precipitation. And while these are uh, relatively straightforward, some are uh, more simple. So for example, the Oxford global friction surface, we're just importing their actual pre-computed index. This is kind of a flavor to show uh, some of the actual more tailor-made indices. And each of these functions, as you'll recall, are actually highlighted on the slides that we've been presenting here. So for this one, we're just pulling out uh, kind of the daytime average max temperature. And the second one, we're pulling out the actual seasonal precipitation max uh, in a monthly term using chirps data. We run these two here. We can then actually uh, set the visualization parameters and render clipped rasters of these two. So the first one we'll run here is for daytime average temperature. 
And because this is a relatively large layer to load in, it will take a second. And so we can go to the seasonal uh, trips information. So you'll see here is a seasonal precipitation max layer here, uh, which is imposed on uh, the country of Bangladesh and clipped to the border as we described above. Um, and so you can see as indicated in the slide deck that this is the same layer and that we can see down here in kind of the southeastern part of the, the country that there's relatively high levels of rainfall um, in terms of monthly maximum rainfall over our time period. And so you'll see here, we've now loaded in the temperature. Uh, and again, we're seeing, uh, you know, along this bay, elevated temperature levels as well. So the next step we've just pulled out as kind of a code comment, but this is the actual process of actually running the index. And so each of these layers, you'll see that, you know, the daytime maximum temperature here was defined and is called. And what we're doing here is we're pulling those those functions that we've described above and actually concatenating them into a, an image stack and then processing the layers as we've described here. And so these go to our asset location, which you could define um, in your own Earth Engine environment and then export them just as assets. So after we've actually processed the data, we then get to here. And so this is, as I described in the slide deck, our starting point here. So we're loading in our pre-computed assets, which are here at the EERSET humanitarian um, environment. So we load these in here. We can then say that we have both the camp data and forest loss data. We've done that because we're doing an average of this, but then the sum at the polygon level for forest loss, as well as our simulated sites, so sample data and sample data forest loss. The first step is actually converting this into our camp data into a pandas data frame, which you can see here. So this is the same as what we've uh, actually outlined above, but now we have actual uh, environmental and climatic information here. The next step is also merging the sample data. And so because of randomly generated index values, we've gone ahead and I've done a spatial merge for here. This is not actually a final uh, feature of the index, but we've included that for your own uh, information. So we've gone ahead and actually done the spatial join here. And then after that, we can bring in the same, so here's our randomly generated index values. We can bring in the same. So these are our simulated camps and their various uh, exposure uh, indicators as they're seen here. So these are absolute values. And you can see that there's a large range and that is the reason why we need to actually perform some normalization. So the last step is to actually concatenate these two together. And now we have our final data frame, which has both our actual camp data as well as our sample data. So the first step in our process is to essentially check for missing data. And so if we do this here, we can see, and if we ignore these more categorical or descriptive stats here about camp name and index, we can see down here that we have uh, some missing values here for specific humidity, surface soil moisture, and subsurface soil moisture. Now, as I described before, we have relatively few missing values. And as you can see, if we're just using these two in our final index, we only have about 11 observations. And so to simplify this process, we've gone ahead and done just mean replacement. Um, but we would definitely recommend if you had a broader case of missing data or if you were doing this um, for an actual decision making process, you would choose another option for imputation. We go ahead and do this and then generate our two sets. So here we have uh, the sample in variable, which allows us to differentiate between uh, the actual Cox Bazaar camps as well as our simulated set. set. And so the next step is essentially to analyze our source data and generate our index input variables. Um, and so we won't go into a ton of depth here, but this is available so that you can actually look at the structure of the data itself and begin to understand how we're constructing the index. So if we run this here, we'll generate essentially plotly charts of each of our variables. I zoom down here. You'll see in the y axis, we actually have the value or the, the indicator here. And then here's the distribution of our camp. 
you'll see in purple, we have our study camps, and then in reddish, we have our sample camps. And so for each of our variables, we can see the distribution. And what we've done here is kind of use this as a qualitative check. So for example, here's flow accumulation. You can see that we have some extreme outliers here relative to the distribution of the rest of our data. So we've gone ahead and run this for each of the actual indicators, and we use this to examine and see where there are gaps. And so this is running the next set of those indicators. And so the next step is to look for potential correlated values. So for example, surface soil moisture and subsurface soil moisture. And this is already uh, kind of indicated in the literature around these variables, but we can see that there is some slight correlation, but not, not overwhelming. We can expand on this by building kind of a larger correlation matrix, which I can run here. And this is looking for correlations between all the values. And so because we've zoomed in here, it's a little difficult to see, but essentially this is creating correlation matrices of all of our camps at uh, the indicator overlap. So you can see this is coefficient of variation of NDVI and pre precipitation. And what we've done is gone ahead and looked for any sort of skew in this data. And we would encourage you to also go through to understand that. So after we've gone through our process, we see that uh, essentially three variables have some amount of skew. And we've gone to the next step, which is to winterize these skewed variables. And the primary one that actually ends up in our, our data set is this flow accumulation. Both forest loss and coefficient of variation of NDVI were excluded because of the exogenous versus endogenous factor that we mentioned earlier. So here we defined a function that actually uh, just clips the data at the 99th percentile. So we'll define that and winterize the data. And then we can look at the distribution of the data now. And we can see a slightly better distribution here. And additional work can be done to clip it even further. We think this uh, correctly estimates our data. So the next step is to actually perform normalization. And so these are our kind of initial set. This is our larger list of, of variables or indicators that we're using. And we're pulling these in and then defining our max min normalization variables as well. And so we take the, the winterized data and normalize it from zero to one. And that's what this process in code is doing here. And so now you'll see that we have normalized our data from zero to one across all of our indicators. And so after normalization, we can look again at subsurface soil moisture and surface soil moisture. And we can see that there is a, a greater correlation here. While there's obviously still some, some difference, we are choosing essentially to pull subsurface soil moisture to just include and focus on, on one, lay, lay, uh, one indicator. So then the final step here is to actually generate the exposure uh, rank, index, and percentile. And so we do that by generating this function here that quickly calculates the exposure, the rank, and the percentile. And then we generate our kind of subset of our exogenous variables as our index right here. And so now we have, in addition to the actual, let's create this into an interactive notebook, uh, in addition to our coefficient of variation, the actual uh, percentile, which is over here. And so the final step is really about interpreting and understanding the normalized exposure index. So to do that, we could create a box plot here. And this is comparing our study camps and our sample camps. And so we can see a relatively normal distribution of the sample camps, but we can see that the actual study camps here, so Cox Bazaar, are relatively overexposed relative to the population of potential other sites. And in fact, there are some that are quite exposed, you know, almost to the 90th percentile. Um, and so if we just look at uh, the first 10, we could see here that there's a set of camps that are coming out here and that we think um, based on our index, have an elevated exposure level relative to the other set of potential locations for camps. And then the last step is that we can run this code to generate our actual exposure curve. And so if we look here, we can see, you know, we have an average exposure of 0.4, but we see that many camps, so these are Cox Bazaar camps here, 
in these points are relatively overexposed um, given our distribution and given our kind of uh, set of indices or given our ind index. So the last step is to look at primary drivers for exposure. And we've done a, a part of this, but we're giving this as kind of an additional exercise so you can look into the data itself. So one way to do this is to just filter based on a percentile and then create an interactive notebook. So if you click this button here, you can create an interactive notebook where you can see all of the various uh, indicators as well as actually sort by percentile here. And so you can see that we have the lowest in here or the highest percentile here. And so then you can manually go through and look for the drivers um, or you could programmatically do this as well. And so we can see, for example, that specific humidity is a clear driver nearly at the top of the entire curve. You can see that seasonal precipitation, again, is another driver, as well as surface oil moisture. And so this data set essentially allows us to then dive a bit deeper and probe into additional questions around sensitivity and other kind of drivers of exposure. But this is our first step into the actual index construction. Okay, and so to wrap up, we are now looking at the same data that we've already processed, and this is looking essentially at the spatial distribution of exposure. And we didn't get into this in the CoLab notebook, as it requires a bit of additional work that's outside the scope of this course, but this essentially provides an overview where we can see two primary findings, we think. One is at the country level, we see between kind of the 23.5 to 22 degrees north across the country, we can see that that's relatively overexposed or has a higher exposure level relative to other areas in the country based on our index. And the second point is that the Cox Bazaar complex, which is highlighted in the red figure here, is actually quite split in terms of the amount of exposure. We can see that uh, the northernmost camp has a couple locations that have a very high level of exposure, which is seen in the, the CoLab notebook. And then some of the more southern camps, or Camp 23, for example, have a lower level of exposure. And so there are some additional questions or additional areas for research here where we can investigate you know, the primary drivers, how do varying spatial resolutions impact the, the, in terms of the actual input data, impact the modeled kind of exposure that we're, we're capturing here. And so we think this is an area for additional research. And so finally, we have the actual kind of exposure curve that we had included in the, the CoLab notebook. And this mirrors our spatial findings where we see that there's a divide between the more northern camps and southern camps in terms of their relative exposure. Um, and some of the camps, for example, Camp 4 or the 4 extension, are really highly exposed relative to other potential areas in the country, as well as the Cox Bazaar complex itself. And so we think that additional validation work here to link these exposure levels to other empirical data on hazard events should be really pursued to bolster the confidence in our findings and continue to iterate to improve the actual ability for our, our index to sort of capture relevant hazards. And so we have some additional last suggestions here around measuring climate exposure in refugee settings. So as we, we've stated before, there's really a variety of modifications that can be done to the actual index to tailor it to best reflect the geography and regionally relevant hazards and risks, especially the risks or hazards identified by refugees themselves. That's kind of an absent uh, group of stakeholders here. And well, Andrew touched on them, I think that a lot of the, the best uh, potential for this work can come through these interactions where we can continue to improve and iterate with these, these groups of refugees. We also want to make sure that we validate our results through conversations with camp managers and refugees again, and ensure that we have some level of ground truthing with observed hazard events and you know, other empirical data if possible. And the final piece that we'll add that we'd like to kind of reemphasize that Andrew was speaking to is that we should really take caution as applied scientists to acknowledge the uncertainties and in the input data and the exposure index itself. There's a variety of decision-making points as we've outlined throughout the process, which could uh, create greater uncertainty or certainty. And we need to make sure that when we actually 
make decisions around prioritization or deprioritization, we ensure that we take those into account and think through the actual complex set of results that could, could come out after that. And so we have some, some additional citations here. And the last step is for questions. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box. We'll be here to answer them in the order they were received. We'll post the Q&A following uh, to the training following the conclusion of the webinar. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. Wonderful. Um, so just reiterating, please uh, get in touch with Michael, Andrew, or me, or all of us, um, if you have any questions about what we presented here. Um, we are uh, working on a formal study along these lines, um, so we'll, we should uh, be very happy to talk about the work that we're doing and how we're applying it to other refugee camp scenarios. Um, our, all of our contact info is here. The training webpage uh, permalink is there at the bottom, um, so please uh, don't hesitate to, to follow up with uh, the full presentation to review the collab um, coding step by step and um, hope to hear from you if you have any questions or, or have some nice uh, results that you'd like to share. Thanks so much for your attention throughout this uh, part of the training and the training at large. That concludes uh, this NASA RSET training on humanitarian applications. Um, thanks again for your interest and uh, hope to hear from you uh, in the future. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you to everybody that have been submitting questions. Uh, we we do appreciate all questions are welcome. So if you if you have any and you've been uh, you know not the the presentation part is over, we do encourage uh, you to submit them to the Q and A box. Uh, we we do have plenty of time in this Q and A session, um, uh, so we do encourage you to submit a question if you have one. So jumping into it, question number one: Why Windsorize the data when the top and bottom percentiles may be of most interest, uh, unless bad data, which can be filtered using quality flags in Google Earth Engine. Uh, crops, thermal shock, uh, heat stress, fire hazard, flood hazard are the first perils that come to mind thinking of extreme values. Uh, I can take a stab at this. That's a good question. Um, Michael, I see you're here too, if you, if you want to follow in. I would just say one thing is we're, we're interested in, of course, uh, capturing the not just the um, extreme values for hazards, we want the general trends, right? So, of course, if we, if we allow uh, all extreme values, extreme outliers to come in, some of those may be due to some of the quality issues that the, the user asks, which is a great point. Um, but we also might just be skewing the index and skewing the actual measurement um, to some of these more extreme values. So in a sense, that's also why we took, you know, mean values over years as well, right? We're not looking at like the worst example year. So it's definitely a different scenario to take uh, to take the more extreme values. Um, but maybe Michael has some follow-on thoughts too. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think this really started with the, the WWF flow accumulation layer, and we found that there were certain uh, kind of pixels where there were really extreme values, and the index got uh, kind of disproportionately skewed because of that, and it almost invalidated uh, the use of that variable. You know, if you have most of the observations in the few thousands, and then all of a sudden there's a pixel, you know, uh, tens or hundreds of thousands, the actual utility of that as an actual variable uh, dropped significantly. And so that was really the, the primary purpose of the Windsor Station. Great, thank you, Jamin and Michael. Uh, question number two, is the exposure index a comparative measure among the camps we want to measure like a ranking? You're going to start, Jamie? Sure, Michael, take it, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think um, we use it for two purposes. The first is, you know, against other hypothetical locations or sites um, for camps. But within camps, I think we haven't done a lot of analysis, you know, uh, you know, actually within the camp themselves. 
And I think you could construct something like that uh, because the complex is relatively large in terms of its distance geographically. Some of the variables actually work quite well, but I think once you get kind of the sub camp level, there are potential questions around the actual quality, um, the spatial resolution of some of the variables that we're including. And so I don't know, you know, if you were to look at other camps, for example, in East Africa that are relatively small compared to this scale, um, you couldn't really assess using these indicators um, and an exposure level, you know, within the camp itself. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, we do have a third question coming in. Uh, thank you so much for those that are submitting them. Uh, we do have plenty of time, so if you have a question and you're online, uh, please do submit one. Uh, question number three, are the Bangladeshi refugee camps large in size because their usage stretches back to 1947 and then again in 1971 and now the Rohingya crisis? Andrew, do you wanna take that one? Are you able to unmute? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, sure. So thank you for the question. Glad you asked the question in terms of understanding the size of the camps. I don't think it's accurate to say they're large because of the because of the the long drawn out, let's say the protracted elements of of the situation there. Um one of the reasons why I say that is because many of the camps that were smaller in size are actually the ones that have been there the longest. So I think the larger size camps, specifically the the one what they call mega camp, which consists of many smaller camps, Kutupalong, it is large because of because of the the influx, you know, the very large number of people uh, moving from Myanmar to Bangladesh in 2000. Uh, 17 into 2018. So, yeah, I would say it's primarily because of that most most recent movement of people. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Uh, question number four. What sources do you use when choosing variables to integrate in the index? What role do locals play in informing about the conditions? Andrew, do you want to take the second part of the question? I could take a stab at the first. Um, so on the, the first piece, we focused, as you'll see uh, during the presentation, a lot of it was really to find variables that were already included within Earth Engine as assets uh, that we could integrate. Because we wanted this to be relatively adaptable to different contexts, um, we also wanted it to be globally applicable rasters in many cases. And so that was um, a main driver. We've done other work where we're including variables that aren't actually sourced from Earth Engine, but I think, um, a lot of the, the data sets that we've included for our index are quite familiar to folks kind of in the climate vulnerability mapping space. And so, um, you know, layers like chirps, for example, is a relatively uh, common data set to include. I think when we were trying to capture other forms of uh, exposure, we had to also look and see what's available um, within the Earth Engine system itself, uh, kind of their own library. But there are often you know, we have we could extend this obviously include other layers but that was kind of a, a an internal choice that we've made but i think andrew you probably have a good um grasp on kind of the okay stakeholder integration in terms of informing conditions on the ground yes so i i think i'm not sh i don't understand the definition of locals here is that referring to uh, people that were are living around the refugee camps or pe or refugees themselves. So I think it's hard to address that question without additional context. But you might be able to add that some of the variables question was informed do your field work in Cox's Bazaar and just 
yeah, intimate knowledge of the kind of hazard profiles. Yes, that's true. I guess I, I'm I'm sensing that the, I'm sensing that this question is is referring to the role of of a certain group of people and how they could inform about conditions and yeah maybe that maybe the person who wrote this question could could elaborate a little bit more in there i just think the answers would be very different depending on uh what group of people you're referring to great uh with that being said whoever did pose that question if you could uh specify a little bit more about the group that you were targeting when you said locals and if you can just clarify that in the q a box uh we will certainly circle back to this question and try to provide um Try to provide an answer for it. Thanks. Uh, looks like some clarification is now coming in. Uh, looks like they mean by locals, I mean people living there that know about the context rather than refugees. So I guess people lo living within that region, um, but they're not necessarily refugees. Thank you for clarifying. I think, I think the best way to answer the question is for this, for, for the example that, from my experience at least, um, the conditions have changed to such a significant degree that while it is important to understand the, his, the, the historical, let's say, change over time of conditions in the area, there are, there are scenarios where that information could be somehow not useful and perhaps even misleading, especially when we're talking about the, the large scale deforestation and terraforming of the land where m uh, many of the, the refugee camps are located. So I don't know the extent to which that, that the, the people that have been living in that area, non-refugees contributed to data collection. However, I think and, and whereas I think that type of information would be useful to some extent, I think it's it's also one of the reasons why we use satellites to get a sense of, yeah, the change over time from a consistent, let's say, source. Um, and that's really useful to see the extent to which some of the areas have changed in terms of land cover, in terms of topography, and then subsequently in terms of hydrology and, and risk of and risk of specific hazards. Great. Uh, Andrew, thank you for, for clarifying the answer for question four. Uh, and it looks like there's a follow-up one. Uh, question five is in following up to question two. If I would be an interested in just one camp, would the exposure index be informative, i.e. provide info, information to identify areas to prioritize help? I can take a stab at, at least initially. I think the one question really is, you know, at a sub camp level, if there's enough uh, spatial resolution for you to actually identify areas where there could be enhanced exposure in the camp itself. And it's kind of getting back to what I was saying earlier, where at a higher level across a country or a region, I think this is much more applicable. I think when you start thinking about within a camp, you know, you can get back to some of Andrew's points around prioritization and deprioritization. And if there's not enough spatial resolution really in all of the layers, then you also need to be cognizant of some of the um, potential faults in, in applying this just at a kind of sub camp level. Um, but if you wanted to say, does one camp situated uh, in a context relative to other locations in the country, then I think it still is applicable. It's just a question of if it's, you know, at the sub camp level that you're looking for. 
And so there's also other layers uh, and other variables that you could use to kind of build a subcamp index. This is a little higher level. I'll also just follow on to that by saying that there's always choices to be made in camp location. And some of those are made in, in so-called organic or self-settled scenarios where refugees settle new establishment across the border during kind of, you know, immediately during following the, the initial displacement. But many of these scenarios, including those at, at, um, at least the majority of camps at Cox's Bazaar, <clears throat> were planned. That scenario going forward, um, it's this this relative climate index um, is really valuable in that sense because we can lay out the potential choices uh, and understand some of the, which is what the simulated sites, simulated camps are all about. Um, we can lay out some of those potential scenarios to guide future decision making. So the the kind of, we didn't really touch on in the presentation, but some of the, uh, there's a kind of formalized handbook for site planning and, and selection, but the kind of data that we're looking at here are not really concerned, uh, are, are not considered rather in that uh, assessment. And of course they, they could be. What we're trying to present here is a way of making better use of climate and environmental data to have a very detailed understanding that would allow us to compare the viability of different sites, the hazard profiles of different sites, would need to do this in every single camp, so, uh, camp establishment context or camp siting context. Um, but in already risk prone areas, uh, I think there's a lot of value uh, to doing this. So at that level of sort of like at one camp, um, that's where that one camp could be. We have a bunch of choices and we can compare them and have a relative index. So future camps, um, single camp selection could uh, could be used in this scenario. Great, thank you, Jamin and Michael. As Andrew, we're waiting, oh, please go ahead, Jamin. I was going to say, Andrew, I wonder if you have any thoughts, because some of the work that you were doing was um, a bit closer to the subcamp level work in terms of decision making frameworks. It might be useful to to talk about some of those ideas and kind of decisions, for lack of a better word, that you were using while you were trying to construct how you actually look within the camps themselves. Yes. So something to add on this front, we were the work that we were doing was was definitely well. The, let's say this: the questions that were being asked related to disaster risk management were, some of them were related to sub camp level um, actions. And it was, there were moments when we, we had to think more about the appropriateness, you know, of for in downscaling different variables to match all, what what was perceived to be the level of decision making at like the sub clamp level, for example. Um, and sometimes, you know, the data, the, the spatial scales just weren't weren't matching. And I think that is something to to highlight. Some it, it could be there are times when the data is not certain data sets are not appropriate to integrate into decision making. And sometimes it's due to uh, spatial scales that don't match the decision making context sometimes it has to do if you're looking at forecasts just like lead time um, doesn't match with the amount of lead time that's needed to take action in either one camp or multiple camps but again i think this is where a lot of our work was in identifying what questions were being asked related to disaster risk management um, and then also yeah, like what actions could be taken? Uh, how do you justify taking actions using different data? How do you prioritize certain camps and sub camp areas? And then on the other hand, how do you deprioritize when everyone is the mo most vulnerable by definition? So I think just going back to that point is, is important to highlight here.
Again, we have just over 20 minutes. Uh, we do encourage if anybody out there that's uh, that's online, if they if they have a question, there are no bad questions. We encourage them. So please, uh, if if there is one you want to uh, ask this excellent panel of presenters that we have for you today, uh, please do submit it in the Q and A box. Another thing I would like to highlight as we're waiting for other questions to come in is the homework is now live on the training page if you if you go to the training page and scroll down underneath part four uh, there is a link to the homework that homework is inclusive of all four parts of this webinar series and so we do encourage you you have until uh, i believe it's july 5th to uh, complete and submit that homework based upon the uh, today's presentation as well as the first three parts of the presentation. So uh, we do hope that you will access that and start working on the homework. And one other thing I would like to make you aware of is after the conclusion of this webinar series, you will all be receiving in your inbox, in your emails, a survey that will be sent uh, with a list of questions uh, it will not take that long to complete. It typically takes around five minutes, but we do hope, we we strongly encourage that everybody please do uh, take the time, the five minutes it takes to complete that survey and submit it so that we as a program, our set, as well as all the presenters can get the feedback from you on what worked, what didn't work, what you would like to see uh, uh, changed going forward, as well as uh, suggestions that you have for uh, uh, future RSET trainings within this application area of, of uh, humanitarian applications. So please do, uh, you should be receiving that survey probably by early next week. And we do hope that you all take the five minutes it will take to complete it. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you for whoever just submitted this question. Question number six, how different is the indexing approach used here from the analytical hierarchy approach uh, which one gives a better susceptibility outcome? Um, I can take a stab at that. We didn't consider the analytical hierarchy approach. We haven't run as a comparison. That's a good uh, suggestion. So that, that AHP approach takes uh, basically a uh, takes a different kind of weighting scheme where you explicitly describe the magnitude of the importance. You, see you have um, different weights that are scaled with respect to each other. Um, so you could have one category of concerns that are each uh, collectively represent a, a sort of a, a quarter of the overall weight. And you may have another category of concerns that collectively represent uh, an eighth of the overall weight. And that that analytical, that hierarchy then allows you to subdivide and, and uh, general themes of concern in our case, and then look at all the variables that make up that theme of concern. And for example, you could uniformly weight them within each category, but then that category itself only represents a quarter of the total concern, or, or you could say the, the contribution to the index is really what we're, what that would translate to. Um, that's a really nice way to do it. We, in this case, didn't uh, certainly could take that approach. Um, we only really have these two two high level categories, um, geophysical and then climate and environment. So uh, we didn't we didn't take that approach. Uh, it could certainly do that. We also just to be concrete about it, we uniformly weighted all of our variables. Um, different sensitivity analyses could be undertaken, or certainly adapting this kind of approach in different contexts that may see different variables brought in it also may see um different weighting of these of these story uh, of these different variables going back to the earlier question um how do you even assign those weights that's um tough to do sort of um outside of a of a of a scenario where you test and gauge the impact of um, the inclusion of these in, the, in these different variables in the index, both in terms of the, the uh, sensitivity of the climate um, exposure index, as well as the priorities identified by um, 
in our scenario, uh, refugees and camp managers living in Cox's Bazaar. Um, so with additional data, I think you could have a more nuanced waiting scheme. But in this uh, presentation, we're just sort of giving the nuts and bolts, I guess, of this and introducing this idea, which uh, hopefully has has some flexibility so that you could certainly ad adapt this AHP approach that doesn't change the fact that you're doing an index, it just changes how you basically would undertake the weighting scheme and how you conceptualize the contributions of different variables to that exposure. Yeah, I guess the only other thought that I'd add is that there's often, you know, we've found there's not enough empirical data for us to test um, and really categorize uh, and quantify the, the actual hazard events at a large enough scale that we could, I think, feel um, informed enough to create a, a different weighting scheme. And so that's why we've really taken the uniform weighting approach. But I think in other scenarios or other contexts, it is definitely feasible and, and something that should be considered. We did some sensitivity tests for these uh, locations here, and then also some of our other work in East Africa, just using variable replacement. And we found that the, the actual exposure index is relatively robust to that, but there's obviously many other ways that you can construct this. And I think, you know, as Jamie was highlighting, this is um, a framework for thinking through how you would assess exposure, maybe not necessarily a, a one size fits all approach. Great, thank you, Michael and Jamin. Uh, the next question is for Andrew, and it looks like it is from somebody who is working within the humanitarian sector. Andrew, you mentioned the high number of products available in Cox's Bazaar context. Would you say that most of them were just not used? As the humanitarian sector worker, I know the amount of information available, usually a little relevant and definitely not used. How do I focus on what actually can be useful? How do I avoid this overproduction of underused reports and assessments. So thanks, thanks for the question. I'm glad, I'm glad that you're you're highlighting some of these questions from a from a decision maker perspective. I should say, I mean, this is surprisingly to me. It's this has been become a, a significant part of my work to act as kind of like a, a broker or a translator between the humanitarian decision-making world, humanitarian sector more broadly, I'd say, but specifically for decision-making on the ground and like the climate science, um, earth observation community. And there's no real, I'd say, simple answer here. I think a lot of this come, a lot, a lot of the, the best practices around identifying what data is, is useful uh, can be broken down to to building relationships with the developers and disseminators of the information. Um, another key point when to say no, thank you. You know, I mean, sometimes uh, it's sometimes it's hard to to say to say that we don't necessarily need another product. But I think that that could be really powerful and would lead the developer of that of that. Of that data or data derived product to think more about what does it mean to to think you're helping necessarily i mean i think normalizing the discussion around like well you know the data actually wasn't that useful and could have potentially made things a little bit more complicated i've definitely been in situations where that was the case um and as as you know as a humanitarian worker you have to make a decision and many times there's there could be too much data and too little time so Thinking about questions like, is the data is is the data available sufficient? You know, is the data available ideal, and is the data available actually making things more complicated? Like these sorts of questions, I think are important to 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 process. And the, I, I would say the more that you have relationships, not only with the developers of the data, but also with with people that kind of operate between the spaces, Oops. Um, that will increase the chance of, let's say, more efficient um, filtering of what data could be useful and perhaps could not be useful, and also allowing for um, 
yeah, a stronger relationships between the, the people developing the data, disseminating it, and then, all, and then yourselves and your team. Uh, we do have, maybe this is a time to share a recent paper on this topic that a colleague and I published talking more about like the questions and the roles and responsibilities operating as you're operating between the, the climate data space and the humanitarian making space. So I don't know where the best place to place the link. Would it be in the Google Doc here or would it be in the chat here? Uh, right into the Google Doc, Andrew, if you would, right under question seven, if you can just put that link right in there. Okay. Yeah, this paper has some, I mean, it's an academic paper, so um, it's not really written in a way that is intending to, let's say, develop standard operating procedures necessarily, but it is a reflection on the need for this sort, this type of work. You know, not only not only producing tools or producing interfaces and 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 hoping it helps, but talking about the roles and responsibilities on both sides. You know, the more responsibility has to be placed on data scientists and climate scientists for sure, but then it also speaks to the need for perhaps additional training and enhancing the the, the knowledge, baseline knowledge at least around climate data and risk data for the humanitarian sector. Um, but yeah, this that this the paper was meant to kind of enhance this discussion, and it's definitely a place to to think more about um, how how what does it mean to integrate climate and risk data into decision making, and when it is and when it may not be kind of as as easy and as useful as as we all think. So, but I'm I'm also glad to talk more about this. It's something that I've I've has really become a big part of my work over the past five six years. So. Uh, feel feel free to reach out over over email, which is I think at somewhere maybe on the top of this document. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew, it's it's so great uh, that you're able to contextualize all this with your background in remote sensing science, but also your work within the sector, uh, both on the ground working directly with decision makers. Uh, it's just, yeah, very valuable having you part of this presentation. And uh, Andrew's email contact is uh, both within the slides that are currently on the web page, uh, the contact information, as well as on this Q&A document. So, um, so yeah, please, I think all of the presenters have encouraged you to reach out if you have any follow-ups. Uh, question number eight, what was your experience with the final users of the results of this research? So I guess I would probably punt this again to Andrew because this is still something that we're working on and developing. Um, it's more of an academic approach than Andrew's, and I feel like you have a a better uh, context that you can share, Andrew, in terms of the actual results um, of your work in Cox's Bazaar, because this is still you know in development. Yes. So I will say that some of the outputs of, of our work led to a better understanding of, of landslide risk, you know, baseline landslide risk, and then also thinking about what could a an anticipatory action system look like related to landslides. So there are, I'm not sure of the current status actually, just because this project was quite a few, was a few years ago now, but yes, to answer your question directly, it led to a an in, improved understanding of landslide risk and also the ability to um, to understand what actions can be taken to decrease risk of landslides um, in the in the Cox's Bazaar area. Great, thank you, Andrew and Michael. Uh, question number nine, in your opinion, confusing radar images into pan sharpened optical data deduct the urban sprawl area outside the metropolitan cities? I can uh, take a stab at this, um, a little bit outside the scope of this part of the training, but um, if you're interested in urban sprawl, um, pan sharpening suggests that you're probably working with Landsat uh, data and you're interested in going from 
30 meter down to 15 meter data. Um, you probably don't need pan sharpening if you're going after urban sprawl, because urban sprawl takes place at scales that are well beyond um, that sort of 15 meter scale. Um, it depends on the city, but you could, uh, you probably are okay with a moderate resolution system to do this. You don't need to map a city at one meter resolution, for example, to detect urban sprawl. Um, radar data, if you're referring to uh, synthetic aperture radar, like we worked on in part one, uh, that also has a 10 meter nominal resolution. So uh, certainly there's interesting uh, opportunities, valuable opportunities for uh, for fusing radar uh, scatter data with uh, optical data on on reflectance and texture. Um, yep, yeah, that that definitely would be would be helpful. Um, some of that I think just is depending on. Um, well, the timing of the urban sprawl, right? We only have radar for the past, um, the SAR at least, imaging radar, widely available for the past seven years. Um, so, you know, seven years of sprawl, that may not be sufficient. You may need to be going into um, more of the Landsat record um, or even the, you know, MODIS could be effective, uh, daily 250 meter um, coverage. So yeah, lots of, lots of valuable uh, things to do there. The, the, that kind of work that's done globally right now by, say, the Global Human Settlement Layer or the um, Global Urban Footprint or World Settlement Footprint, actually the up-to-date version of the Global Urban Footprint, uh, those do integrate satellite uh, radar data into their optical assessments. I think the story is still kind of driven by the optical data, um, but the uh, the radar certainly has something to say. Yep, it it, it Correlates in in some ways with what we see optically, but it does pick up um, obviously very different features, different kind of textural sensitivities, and it has a different kind of sensitivity to to infrastructure um, and change as well that we don't have with optical data. So yeah, very complementary approaches. Thanks, Jamin. It does appear that the questions are. Uh, slowly coming to uh, an end. I haven't seen any new questions added. So I do think that uh, just because we are getting close to the top of the hour, I think it's it's appropriate uh, to maybe wrap up a little bit early. Uh, I want to thank everybody that attended today. Uh, I know that this has been a four-part webinar series. Uh, you certainly have busy lives and there's many other things you could be doing with your time. And the fact that you chose it to learn about different uh, humanitarian applications using remote sensing and model data uh, is, is, uh, is one, it's very important. And two, we hope you certainly got a lot of value uh, out of attending these, these trainings. So thank you to everybody that attended. I also wanna thank our guest presenters today. That's Jamin, Jamin Vandenhoek, uh, Andrew Kruza, Kirkovitz and Michael Owen. And uh, we wanna thank all of them for joining us today. And uh, if before we close, I wanted to give them an opportunity to uh, provide any closing thoughts or comments on today's training. So Jamin, over to you. Thanks, Sean. Um, really appreciate you setting, uh, really spearheading uh, the organization of this four part series. And thanks so much to, um, to Selwyn for helping us uh, record and uh, tightening up these presentations as well. Um, yeah, just uh, thanks to all the people in attendance here today that have joined um, at least today and hopefully more than today. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Any questions you have about the work we've done or presented or uh, if you run through some of the code or the uh, whether it's on Earth Engine or working with the Vertex tool from Training One or working with the CoLab from this part. Um, any issues at all, please please get in touch. Um, I uh, really appreciate the interest in RCEP and setting this up in the first place, uh, the humanitarian applications. And I really uh, uh, want to give a big thanks to Michael and Andrew for uh, contributing so, um, so uh, profoundly to uh, this study that we, or this work that we shared here in this part and also uh, the presentation today. Thanks everyone. And uh, I guess over to Michael. Yeah, I just echo everything that Jamin just said, but uh, thank you everyone. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Andrew, over to you. 
Thank you, everyone, and thank you for everyone who asked questions. Uh, yeah, nothing really, nothing really to add. Um, but very glad that we had the the space for this. So thanks to NASA RSET for for allowing this space to exist. And yes, this is I guess one I guess one final thought I'll, I'll comment I'll make is if there are people attending here that are kind of interested in this type of work, you know integrating climate and earth observation data into humanitarian applications this is definitely a growing community and there is a need for people to step into this space um, i would say even 10 years ago it was a it was a different type of career path but but yeah so if anyone's in that position either in, in school or just maybe interested in a pivot in career like there's definitely opportunities here so feel free to reach out and glad to discuss more about that Wonderful. Uh, I also uh, want to thank the RSET team that you might not have heard during this webinar series, but they've certainly been working very, uh, very hard in the background to make this uh, a successful webinar series. That's Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, Brock Blevins, Jonathan O'Brien, Sarah Kutchell, and Amita Mekta. So uh, thank you to the RSET team for helping support this training. Again, thank you to our three wonderful presenters, uh, Jamin, Michael, and Andrew. And thank you to everybody joining. Uh, we do, please, uh, the homework is up, it's due on July 7th, so please do take advantage of that. And then also the survey that will be sent out next week, please, please do uh, fill that out because it helps all of our future RSET trainings uh, to improve on them. So again, everybody, please stay safe and thank you again for joining. Bye-bye.